This is Diversity Committee from Alameda High School celebrating uh, Jewish Awareness Month. Um, and we wanted to uh, talk to Professor Shostak um, and talk to him about Jewish heritage and what he lends himself uh, to our community. Uh, so to start off with, uh, Professor Shostak is a sociology professor. He was born in 1937 in Brooklyn, New York. Uh, his Jewish American parents uh, ran a small neighborhood grocery store. After earning a college degree in Cornell and Princeton, uh, he taught first in the University of Pennsylvania and then transferred over to Drexel University for 37 years. Uh, he's an author of 34 plus books and many articles. Uh, he now lives in Alameda with his wife Lynn and their dog Max. Uh, he enjoys video chatting, um, and especially with his grandchildren uh, who are very diverse. Uh, so thank you, Mr. Shostak, for coming on. Uh, to start off with this meeting, uh, I'm going to ask you um, a question, and then I was wondering if you can talk to me a little about that. So the first question I wanted to ask is, what um, in Jewish American history uh, merits inclusion in the teaching of U.S. history, and what can you tell me about that? We could begin with the um, proclamation from President Trump, which uh, celebrates this, this month. He says, today, the day that he signs the proclamation, we recognize the resilience of the Jewish community in the face of great adversity and celebrate the countless ways Jewish Americans have strengthened our nation. Now, in that connection, I want to recommend a website which appears every day. So 364 days of the year, there's something called jewishcurrents at gmail.com. And today, the Jewish currents, every, every day of the year, they salute the contribution of an American Jew to this country of ours. Today, they celebrate a gentleman named Dr. Abraham Jacoby, who established the first children's health clinic in America and pioneered here in pediatrics. He established the first pediatrics hospital, um, the, the pediatrics department of a hospital, and he was the earliest, um, one of America's earliest advocates of birth control, advocated breastfeeding, proposed safe breast milk substitutes, and this I didn't know, he advocated the low boiling of milk, which was probably the single greatest contribution before antibiotics to lowering infant mortality rates. That's kind of neat. And every day of the year, they not only salute an American Jew, but they also give you the previous years, going back four or five years, other Jews saluted on that day. In short, the Jewish American contribution is very significant and involves thousands. Jews have been in this country for a rather long time. The first 23 Jewish refugees arrived here at New Amsterdam in New York City area, New Amsterdam under Peter Stuyvesant, they arrived here in 1654, quite a long time ago. And they have been contributing, as with this doctor I mentioned, ever since. Um, the profile of um, the American Jewish community ought to be known quickly to you. There are 7,500,000 American Jews, and um, they are older than the average American population. They are more liberal than the American population. They are more often Democrats than true of the American. 51% of them are Democrats versus 34% of all Americans. We have the largest Jewish community in this country in the whole world. We have more Jews here than in Israel at this time. 
So that's some background. Um, you might also be interested to know that 18% of the American Jewish community are converts. Judaism does not seek conversion, but people come to Judaism and are welcomed. Interesting. Thank you for sharing. Thank you. Um, Thank you. Um, we also want to talk to you more about altruism, which is an important overlooked aspect of the Holocaust. Can you elaborate on that bit? Altruism. Yes, altruism is a big research focus of mine. I've spent some time a number of years with it. The representation that we generally have of the Holocaust is called the horror story. Okay? And the horror story is what the perpetrators did in an incredibly terrible way to their victims. That's been the main focus, so that the, the Holocaust is a subject that causes people to get upset with its very mention, and to want to change the subject kind of thing. I regret that because my research and my interviews and my study has me persuaded that there are two sides to the coin. There is on one side the horror story, no question. There is on the other side the neglected side, what I call the health story. Right. Now, what health, story, health story is what people did for one another, what victims did for one another, often, often at risk of their life. Inside the health story, there is a continuum, a range of behavior. At one end of the continuum, public expressions of compassion and sympathy frequently Jewish victims would get that from Gentile neighbors, okay? But the other end of the continuum is forbidden against the laws of the German state, against the laws of the Nazis, forbidden behavior that could only be done in secret. And that's what I call secret altruism. Altruism is caring behavior done with no expectation of personal reward. It's done because you must do it. It's done because we are wired. It's part of our DNA to respond to people's plight. You must do it. It's done because we are wired. It's part of our DNA to respond to people's plight. Thank you for elaborating about that. And, you know, as you mentioned, with trying to shift how we talk about Jewish American history in school and, like, focusing more on the health story and, like, the stories of victims and survivors, uh, we wanted to get your perspective about how um, this focus on, like, victims and survivors and, like, the human aspect, how we can implement that change here at our school and use that to, like, um, apply that same idea to other AHS cultural and history months. Excellent question. Now, I looked over, thanks to your website, I looked over the wonderful range of months that you're interested in, some of which you've already helped with, Arab Month, Black American Month, all of these are in your background. My notion is that in schooling, and particularly with respect to your committee, every month that you come to know better an ethnicity, a nationality, a religion, every month I'd like you to have on the agenda list the research agenda list, the help story. It is not well known by any of the groups. It is basically in the shadows, and it has to be brought in from the shadows. It has to have 49% of the attention. 51% could go to horror story, all groups. 
all groups have suffered in one way or another. Fine, let's always never forget, never forgive, never again. At the same time, let's bring that 49% of the forbidden care that all groups have in their history, let's bring that forward in high school courses, in history, in political science, wherever it fits appropriately, let us salute nobility. Thank you. And yes. Um, how do American Jews regard the Holocaust? That's a very um, vital part of American Jewish consciousness. Some recent years ago, actually in 2013, so seven years ago, a study was made where American Jews were asked, here are 10 aspects of being Jewish. For example, keeping a kosher kitchen, or going to synagogue, or pursuing social justice, or remembering the Holocaust. That came in number one at a great distance above all the others. So the commemoration, once a year we have a day called Yom HaShoah, which is the day of heroes and martyrs. It's marked by Jews around the world. In this country, it is marked by almost all the temples and synagogues we have, and of course it gets television coverage. In short, they regard the Holocaust as a binding experience, and they have two mottos, which some of you will recognize. One model is never forget, and the second model is never again. And that enables me to add to this American Jewish contribution, opposing anti-Semitism. The American Jewish community is on the alert, always, 25 hours a day, eight days a week, for hints of unreasonable, irrational hatred of Jews and Judaism. And we have organizations, Anti-Defamation League, other organizations that are endlessly working with the FBI and with local police to monitor and to hold down and to rebut the prejudice that is in the background of the Holocaust. Thank you. And it's very, very important to realize that and, and how our maybe environment doesn't accept it as, as much as we would like to and kind of been passed down in history and has been like filtered through and I think it's important to acknowledge it um, more in recent times. The writer that some of you will recognize, Franz Kafka, okay, has written that when a Jew is struck down to the ground, mankind falls with him. We cannot have any victimization. In your great video, one of the contributors to your video commented on the absolutely unacceptable harassment occurring in parts of this country today against Chinese Americans in the light of the vile notion that COVID-19 somehow is part of China's fault or responsibility. That's a variation of anti-Semitism. Unfortunately, polls suggest that 27% of the American population presently believes that Jews killed Christ, and that's in the background of their anti-Semitism. Well, that's quite unreasonable. The Romans did it, and the Jews were bystanders. That's another whole subject. But Jewish opposition to hatred and to prejudice 
is one of the main contributions that Jews make to this country. Thank you. Thank you. Um, Um, so, um, we have a young, uh, committee member here that is, um, talking with you, and she identifies as Jewish American, and so I think there's definitely a big difference, and there's prejudice against expressing your culture and your identity or your, uh, religion when you're young, and when nobody like you often is like you. And so what can you tell to that student or students um, and how can they embrace their religion safely um, and how can we be accepted more? I, I, I think that part of the answer, because it's a complicated, complicated subject, but part of the answer has to do with self-esteem, with feeling proud um, and I heard this often in your video, okay? Feeling proud of background, feeling proud of my group, taking pleasure in cuisine, taking pleasure in costume, taking pleasure in family practice, taking pleasure in holidays, Chinese New Year, holidays, Japanese Memorialization Day. So my wife and I have been to the Hiroshima Peace Museum and watched with keen appreciation the presence of hundreds of school children that regularly visit that. And Israel has Holocaust museums and are part of the curriculum there. In short, basically standing tall with one's history, one's group history, and um, recognizing, as your committee name implies, that diversity is one of the major links in the chain that binds us to one another. And satisfaction with diversity, very, very important. Okay. Oh, one, one little personal footnote. As a high school student, myself, the age of many of you, when I reached the high school brand new, I looked over the landscape, and I was invited to go immediately into the honors section of the high school. But the honors section was dominated, almost 90% perhaps, by Jewish Americans like me. And that didn't appeal to me, because I didn't think I would learn very much from people just like me, so I immediately signed up for the orchestra section of the high school. All the musicians were in the orchestra section. We had black, we had Italian, we had Catholic, we had Protestant, and then a couple of Jews like myself in the orchestra section. For athletics, I had a choice, and I joined the track team, because the track team had this great diversity of people. And I did all of this deliberately, because I wanted to get to know other types of people. Sure. So immersing yourself in different groups to allow you to get to know other races, genders, backgrounds is important? Invaluable. Invaluable. We've got, you know, seven and a half billion people on the planet, wondrous array of people, and um, it's a strength of the species. Um, we, we are not a race, we are a species, and our species thrives on variation. It makes us supple. It makes us equal to challenge. In your generation, and really also your grandchildren, <laughs> your grandchildren, okay, are going to be wrestling with climate change for a long time to come. And part of our ability to handle climate change is in diversity of viewpoint, diversity of strength, aptitude. Yes, diversity with an exclamation point. Thank you. 
Um, let's see. Uh, so, uh, what, in like a sentence, what do you want uh, students to take away from this 40 minute interview? Like, what is the broadest but almost detailed point that you want to share uh, that people can take away? What is your message today in speaking with us? Okay, like bumper sticker fashion, okay. The, the message is, People are fundamentally good. People are wired to care about one another. And a big part of our informal education, now some of it can be formal, some of it can be formal study of altruism, formal study of what I call stealth altruism, secret caring behavior, there was secret sharing behavior, by the way, in mid-passage. Do you recognize mid-passage? African slaves coming over uh, in the 1700s in the, in the bottom hole of Dutch slave ships. We think of that as the horror story. In fact, research finds that in the whole of the Dutch slave ships, slaves cared for one another. People in prisons care for one another. So the bumper sticker lesson I'd like you to take is find and celebrate the good that we are wired to provide for one another. Bring that forward and make that part of your self-identification, part of your ego, part of your self-esteem. You have a gift from nature. Darwin taught us that if you had two tribes, and one tribe was filled with self-centered, narrow people, only cared for themselves. The other tribe was filled with care-sharing, care-providing people. It's the other tribe, the tribe of care-sharers, that had progeny, that raised children, that went forward. The selfish tribe disappears. Thank you. So I had a follow-up question after hearing more about your experiences at our age, like in high school. And while we were, you know, researching you for this interview today, we came across a lot of your work about speaking about education and uh, particularly your uh specialty in futurism. So I was hoping to ask you more about like your experiences with deciding on what you wanted to do and particularly with futurism and your perspectives about that. Oh, thank you for that. That's a, that's a wonderful question for me personally because I, you know, at age, young age, 82, I'm in a reflective mood uh, a lot lately. In fact, I'm writing a, a memoir, which uh, I was taking a long time to do, 82 years to do. Um, the Futures is a subject that I've worked many, many, many decades on, largely because I come to it searching for evidence, which I find ample evidence. I come for it searching for evidence of encouragement. There are people called catastrophists. They're interested in catastrophes. They are a school in futures. I respect them. Some are my friends, but I disagree with them. They work the dark side of the story. I work the bright side of the story. I don't use the word problem when I teach courses in futuristics. I use the term possibility. I don't focus on mistakes. I focus on what can we learn from mistakes. I don't focus on backsliding, on regret. I focus on risk-taking and what's possible. Um, so my futures is really a part of my self-definition, my notion of making the most of life having discovered a long, long time ago that the speed of light is not the fastest thing we're familiar with, we know. 
you know, sometimes taught that in physics. I don't disagree with it, but I do think that the speed of life is faster than the speed of light. And if light is going to go by that quickly, I urge us to grab hold of its brighter prospects. I urge us to focus on what we can do post-COVID-19 in every degree, in every way, including, by the way, diversity. You all know that 170 nations are suffering now from the COVID-19. Well, in 170 nations, people are researching virus cures. People are researching recovery for people who have had the COVID-19. That diversity of effort is a big piece of my future's focus and my future's research. I have a question. Um, you seem to have a lot of optimism, a lot of, um, you know, hope, and I feel like it takes a lot of experience sometimes to get to that point. So I'm wondering, what challenges have you faced in order to get to where you are right now? Wow. Um, I'll just give you an example, one example, um, because time comes so quickly. Uh, when I arrived at Princeton to start my PhD program in sociology, they sat me down in an office with an admissions person, and the admissions person said, uh, there are going to be some mm, tests of sorts. So I said, for example, he said, um, you're going to have to pass exams in at least two languages. And I said, well, I've never studied any of them uh, at any length or depth. I speak a little Hebrew, but not not of consequence. And he said, we don't examine in Hebrew, but you'll probably want to pass in French and German. And I said, I know nothing about either of them. They said, well, that's, that's a hardship. And then he said, you'll have to take exams in five aspects of sociology. And I said, I had no sociology. He said, well, that's going to be a problem. And he said, and then you're going to have to take statistics. And I said, I don't like it. I took it once, and it was very difficult. He said, yes, it is challenging. I said, okay, I got five exams, two languages, and statistics. He said, yes. I said, by the way, I have a wife now and a newborn child. Um, I want to complicate things a bit. And he smiled and said, yes, I suspect that's true. So I took two years to do all of that. I took two years because my folks had taught me the NASA model. Are some of you familiar with the NASA, National Space Administration model? The model is failure is not an option. Okay. One more quick anecdote there. When I was in uh, kindergarten, the first grade, I brought home my first report card. Can you remember back to your first report card? It usually has, you know, check marks or something. This one had letter grades, which is so odd, first grade or something. And with some trepidation, I handed it to my father, and he looked at it, and he scanned it, and he quickly said, because um, I had a B. I had all these A's, and I had one B. And my father said, how could you do this to your mother? I was devastated. I didn't realize my B was going to hurt my mother that much. And I resolved at the moment, only A's from this point on, because I love my mother. As all of you love yours. And uh, in short, you just measure up. You just do what you have to do, in part because failure is not an option. Was it hard to choose this career to dedicate your life to um, investigate and promote and inform people about your causes? Or was it hard? Um... Was it an easy choice? I think, I think it's been a pleasure. It's been so gratifying. I mean, I've worked on many, 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 many social problems, and I've moved the needle a bit forward with some of them. Um, 
in my memoir, I'm going to reflect on why I didn't have more success, and I'm going to offer ideas for others to move the needle beyond what I was able to achieve. But gratification from assisting other people is uh, one of life's enormous, enormous rewards, and I recommend it highly to you. There's an idea of living for profit, and then there's the idea of living for contribution. And my 82 years has me recommend um, that we do more. For example, um, when I got involved with men in abortion, that is an unusual subject, um, which deserves a lot more attention in high school, high school years. Okay? One of the things I discovered was that the abortion challenge was being defined narrowly as a woman's problem. And I didn't think that was correct. So I spent some time, and I did a book on this and a lot of research, I regard it as a couple's challenge. Remember, I don't use the word problem. It's a couple's challenge. I emphasize that because we want to bring the male into the experience. We don't want guys to get a pass on this. We want to recognize that conception is a product of a couple's behavior. And guys have got to be responsible. Guys have got to take the subject to heart. Guys have got to understand that um, they ought to contribute to the best possible resolution of what is often an ill-timed and unwanted pregnancy. They ought not to be sidelined to be off the seat. That's an example of contributing, I hope. I have a question. Go ahead. Okay. Um, so you're talking about how um, like you're a very optimistic person, how you always try to look at the brighter side of things. And I know a lot of people sometimes can get down or start seeing a lot of negatives. So I want to like know like what are ways you think people can start thinking in a more positive light and can have like kind of help people work better into becoming more positive and having a more positive mindset. Wonderful question, and, and I think part of the answer is share good stories with one another. There is an old country notion that if you take credit for something you've done that you're proud of, God thinks of it as uneven behavior. I disagree with that old country notion. I think that God, or whatever the force is, smiles at your sharing the word of something you've done, some act of charity, some act of care. Um, during this COVID-19, it's neat if some teenagers are shopping for elderly or shopping for uh, handicapped people. It's neat if teenagers are making telephone calls, perhaps to complete strangers who are shut-ins, but are giving the shut-in 35, 40 minutes of easy conversation. If we can make common the concept of care sharing, we will have come far forward. We will have strengthened all of ourselves. You're familiar with the notion of multiplier effect. You've heard that in your classrooms, economics, and elsewhere. Yes. Advertising, speaking publicly, a good you have done has a multiplier effect. Thank you. All right, so we have about five more minutes. Um, does anyone else have a question before I speak over you guys? Anyone? All right. Uh, my last question, I guess I would ask, is uh, sociology is definitely, you know, a major or a topic that I, I haven't really heard about before you really spoke about it. And I think it really lends to yourself and how you uh, preach uh, what you teach. And that allowed you to come to us and talk to you about it because you were integrated into this 
into this topic and this career path um, kind of kind of mixed with Jewish heritage but also profession uh, how should you encourage other students to understand this major and maybe preach what they feel um, their diversity lends to our environment this major sociology is the scientific scientific study of human group behavior. It complements psychology, which focuses on the actor. The actor is embedded in groups. Sociology studies the actor in the group. Okay? There is a third discipline called social psychology, which is a bridge between the two. So between psychology focus on the person, Sociology, focus on the group, and social psychology, which takes the best of both of these, you have this wonderful array of social sciences that really need your support, need your best effort. They are vital in moving humanity forward because they bring science and the arts, science and the humanities to bear on our possibilities. Absolutely. I happen to find sociology, what, in fact, when I first started in, in sociology, I asked the advisor at Princeton, I knew nothing about the subject, and I said, what is it about? And he said, it's a pass, a green light to study anything you want to study. Right. And that was a, a, an epiphany for me. That was a wonderful invitation, which I um, have profited from my entire life. I commend the discipline to you. Beautiful. Well, thank you so much. Diversity really appreciates that you take the time and we can speak with you. For students watching this on our website or on our Instagram, can they reach you somewhere to ask you further questions or want to know more about you? I would be very pleased to exchange ideas. It's easy. It's my entire name, Arthur Shostak, uh, A-R-T-H-U-R-S-H-O-S-T-A-K, Arthur Shostak at gmail.com. And as a 16-year retiree, I'm generally available, and I promise to be responsive. Perfect. Well, thank you so much. Have a great day, and we will, I will send you the link to this interview in case you want to share it with other peers. One, 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 one last thought. Absolutely. One last thought is it's a pleasure, actually it's an honor, to be in your company. The work that you are doing, the campaign you're on, is a vital one. And your contribution will be life shaping and life enriching. So thank, thank you, you for having me. Thank you. Thank you.